Well, hello everyone. An interesting video today, to say the least. I'm going to summarize everything, everything. Well, most things that I think exactly are what pyramids are, the criteria of what a pyramid is, because a patron has asked me to reconcile my theory of the pyramids with his theory and Christopher Dunn's theory that there is clearly high technology on the interior of the pyramids. And we'll get to the patron's question later. It's a patron sponsored video for a hundred bucks. I'll make your video. I'll research your topic. Why not? That sounds like a good damn good deal to me. And if it sounds like a good deal to you, then you know what to do. And I think I can actually explain the presence of high technology in the pyramids, even worldwide. So let's explain why. But first, I need to explain what my theories are, which are very well-researched theories. I've read literally every pyramid book you can get. Let's get to it. I'll show you what I found. It's very interesting. Very interesting. So it's no secret that pyramids are found worldwide. Books such as Voyages of the Pyramid Builders by Robert Schock and The New Pyramid Age by Philip Copens, both written in the first decade of the current millennium, in line with the realization, thanks to the internet, that there are pyramids literally everywhere, inspired and showed me that there is a common theme to all pyramids, no matter where they are found. This led me to actually realize that the entire Egyptological approach to understanding pyramids is flawed, as archeologists never, ever, operate from a worldwide perspective, only a local perspective. So how then can they analyze a worldwide pyramid religion? It seems archaeology is structurally unsuitable for explaining pyramids, the irony. They literally ignore the existence of pyramids in other parts of the world and even claim pyramids are indigenous developments to Egypt. They even say that humans naturally will build pyramids. That's funny, I can't recall ever building a pyramid. So leaving archaeology, I turned to worldwide prehistory and anthropology in terms of mythologies of world origins. And there I found the answers I was seeking. I found out what pyramid actually means, but more on that later. My quest for answers got me thinking. What does the word pyramid even mean? And where does it originate? The question consumed me. I traveled the world collecting photographs and wrote a book trying to answer this very question. Author after author, even annoyingly the late genius Philip Copens, assumed a definition. They claimed that a pyramid must be a certain shape, the pyramid shape, to actually qualify as a pyramid. Otherwise, they say it isn't a true pyramid. Really? This is despite no one knowing what pyramids are for or what they are supposed to represent. In no ancient text, mythological or historical, can I find the importance behind the shape of a pyramid or the supposed shape of a pyramid even discussed. It's unimportant. So nowhere is the five-sided pyramid shape mentioned. Instead, everywhere I see reference to world tree, the primal mound or world mountain as the origin and center point of the world. Is that what pyramids are? So a decade ago, I was annoyed to see Samir Osmanengik's discoveries in Bosnia were being rubbished by proud archaeologists who were not included in his digs. I felt these archaeologists were unqualified to speak about, let alone rubbish pyramids. They are not pyramid experts. They haven't done the homework. Samir Osmanengik did his PhD on pyramids. And they pointed to his mountain and they said it can't be a pyramid because it's debatable whether it was built by man and it's not square-sided. To be a pyramid in their eyes, a structure must be totally man-made and a certain shape. But doesn't this go against the whole world mountain concept? And doesn't this impose a modern, arbitrary and assumed definition upon ancient peoples? Of course, 
If pyramids are world mountains, this means that pyramids are not just tombs, or not even tombs at all. Though they are associated with graveyards, and later generations, well, they may have used them for tombs. No one even watching this video now knows what the term really means because I found it in an article in the 1972 Britannica. This is the earliest known usage of this world from a Egyptian mathematical papyrus and it's nothing to do with shape. It's nothing to do with fire within. Let me quote and tell you right now what is written. In this article, it says, the ancient Egyptian term of pyramid is myrrh. The English word pyramid comes from the Greek pyramid plural, pyramides, a word of doubtful etymology that was thought to have been derived from the ancient Egyptian per emu us, a term used in mathematical papyrus to denote the vertical height of a pyramid. A purely Greek word, pyramid, means wheat and cake. And there you have it, I repeat. Egyptian per emu us, a term used in a mathematical papyrus to denote the vertical height of a building. That is the vertical height of what the Egyptians called a mur. And per emu us, it sounds like perimeter, and it sounds like other mathematical words. And, and, and to, me to measure the perimeter seems to measure the circumference of a pyramid, does it not? So per us, I looked it up in the Wallace Budge Dictionary. It's a bit older than the, um, than the Britannica definition. Wallace Budge, he read every Egyptian manuscript and he came up with his own definitions. His definition was it means the edge, ledge or slope of a pyramid. So it's, it's a mathematical function of something that looks like a pyramid is a peremus. But it seems he was not quite sure what the function was. Britannica refined it down to the height. So it's saying it's very tall. I found out from their location that the pyramid religion and the world mountain religion are one and the same religion. The world mountain is placed in the center of a land mass or land area used by a civilization because it's in the center of the world. Now we see this in the placement of Giza. And I discovered that a medieval map of the UK made by the chronicler Matthew Paris 800 years ago places Silbury Hill, a chalk circular pyramid covered in earth in the precise center of what was seen as the rectangular landmass of the country to the south of Scotland. Silbury Hill is not in the center of this landmass in actuality, nor is it rectangular, but it was seen to be, at least symbolically, in ancient times. It dawned on me. I was actually staring at a Copper Age or Bronze Age map of the UK. They made maps back then. In other words, I could redate this supposed medieval map, which must have been transcribed by Matthew Paris, to possible original origins of around 2400 BC, which is when not only Silbury Hill was built, but exactly when Giza was also built, the Pyramid Age. It's, it's the same time. This solidified for me that the intention of the pyramid or pyramid complex was the rebuilding of World Mountain for fertility reasons. If you want, you can call it the Tower of Babel. And what was the point of the Tower of Babel? To build something which reaches heaven. The evidence for this is even more pressing when you realize the intention was always to make pyramids as white as possible. Something also realized by Robert Schock in his books, like the snow-capped peaks of a high mountain, but also similar to the color of the moon. This led me to realize that the shape, the shape of a pyramid, is only of secondary importance, providing certain criteria are met. And if you meet these criteria, you can call what you have built a pyramid. Now, here is what I've come up with. You may or may not agree. That's fine. We're learning. In my studies, I noticed that firstly, a pyramid 
very usually must be very large. And, and my patron mentioned this again. He asks me, why does a pyramid have to be so large? Surely there's something technological behind this. Surely it means it's a power plant. And I'm saying, well, this is probably because it must actually represent an entire mountain upon which the tree to heaven was placed, mighty Yggdrasil, or whatever name it went by in one's chosen culture. Yggdrasil represents the triple structure of the world, heaven above, humans in the middle, hell below at the roots. Triplicity is something we see very often in the Stone Ages and in the pyramid religions. Giza actually had a possibly sacred sycamore tree growing on the plateau until recent times, but a tree is not necessary if you emphasize size and height, something reaching heaven. The next criteria is directionality. Pyramids do seem to feel the need to point to the cardinal points. And at the start, I didn't know why this was. I wrote in my Pyramids book 2015, this was probably because pyramids superseded a type of totem pole from old Europe and from Asia, and probably North Africa as well, that she called the staff god, a four-faced god, which presumably was facing uh, different directions. And yes, I thought that was the case. But now I'm, after seeing the temple of Veshevan Kovil, a video I called the truest pyramid I've ever seen, it finally dawned on me that the pyramid is precisely, exactly the same as the Hindu mythology about World Mountain. This is a temple in India. It's not a temple at all. It's a pyramid. And one can see that it, it points to the cardinal points, but what is emphasized is that there are four elephants holding up the planet, symbolized by a hemispherical turtle or tortoise shell, equally spaced. So what else are the four elephants or whatever they are going to be pointing to but the cardinal directions? And that's in the mythology. So that's a criteria for all pyramids. The four pyramids are literally holding up a tortoise shell, a planet. They're holding up a planet, Earth. This is a new criteria for every single pyramid in existence, which I'm introducing today, which no pyramid author mentions. A fact I only realized several months ago. Please watch my video, Reprise of Isaac Newton's Theories. I'll link it below on the research he did into Giza, and you'll see why. Newton knew from ancient sources that the Great Pyramid mapped the size of the Earth. He didn't know why. We are starting to learn why. The Earth, or a sphere representing Earth, must, and I emphasize must, be somehow incorporated into every single pyramid in existence because the world mountain is literally a, a miniature Earth. We're following the mythology here. I believe Newton must also have noticed, based on his mathematical understanding, that the Giza pyramids are endlessly generating, literally screaming out spherical trigonometrical information, which in itself means very little except we know pi, we know phi. But why are they saying that? It could well relate to the spherical Earth. Newton needed to know the size of the planet to find the gravitational constant for his formulae. He never found the exact size, but he knew from ancient writings that the Great Pyramid did represent and contain information about the size of the Earth. And it's remarkable that Newton actually looked to the Great Pyramid in order to find out the size of the Earth, in order to find out the gravitational constant. So Charles, you're saying a sphere is necessary in the representation of a pyramid. So why none at Giza? Well, Matt Simpson, ancient architects, as well as Larry Pahl told me uh, recently, Larry told me in an interview, um, and Matt told me as well in a message that an Arabic source mentioned that where we think there was a capstone was actually an inverted bowl. That is a hemisphere or a sphere. And this all accords with the independent 20th century work of Livio Staccini, who, based on ancient texts as well as his own deductions, highly mathematical, he had two PhDs, PhD in maths, he was a maths professor as well as a historian in his spare time. And he said that the Great Pyramid is clearly an abstracted representation of the northern hemisphere of the Earth. In other words, world mountains were seen as planets. So now suddenly, 
we can explain the Etruscan oddity, the demolished Porcena tomb built five centuries before Augustus united the Roman Empire for all time, or at least for a 30 year peace. And this tomb contained, and I will quote Pliny, because it, you will see what it contained, because it sounds almost exactly like a pyramid from Egypt, except for the spheres, lots of spheres. We're quoting Pliny now. The Porcena was buried below the city of Clusium in the place where he had built a square monument of dressed stones. Each side was 300 feet in length and 50 in height. And beneath the base, there was an inextricable labyrinth into which if anybody entered without a clue of thread, he could never discover his way out. Above this square building, there stand five pyramids one at each corner and one in the center, 75 feet broad at the base and 150 feet high. These pyramids so taper in shape that upon the top of them altogether, there is supported a brazen globe. And upon that again, a pedestal from which bells are suspended by chains. These make a tinkling sound when blown about by the wind as was done at in bygone times at Dodona. Upon this globe, there are four more pyramids, each a hundred feet in height, and above them is a platform on which there are five more pyramids. The Etruscan tomb, to my mind, was clearly trying to represent world tree in an abstracted sense, but also world mountain, everything in one as well as the world itself, maybe the gods of world mountain as well. In fact, the brazen globe and this is a hypothesis, could even have been the sun, and maybe a solar system was represented. Those evil Romans, shame on them for demolishing what their superior megalithic ancestors had created. And guess what? I've noted that on the map, Clusium, where this structure was built, is at the geographical centre of the Etruscan kingdom. So there you go. So I put it to you that whenever you look, wherever you look, you will find a representation of Earth alongside any pyramid. Now, I'm starting to think that the enigmatic stone spheres are Earth representations which must have been found near pyramids or pyramid-shaped plateaus or mountains. They literally represent Earth or planets or the Sun. We see the same thing in Mastabas, prehistoric Mastabas, where archaeologists are even prepared to write that these four-sided structures would then sometimes even incorporate a central mound of Earth, which, was, which they say was symbolic of the world mound. Now, something symbolizing World Mount should ring alarm bells in the minds of archaeologists or anyone familiar with prehistory as uh, World Mounds are found worldwide. But for some reason it doesn't. Now, with all that background, we are starting to approach the problem of technology. And this is the main problem seen at Giza because there is clearly high technology or technology full stop at work at Giza. What kind of technology? We don't know. Since the World Mountain was the main religious object of a pyramid civilization, everyone, everyone's best efforts needed to be dedicated to it. It explains why Giza, why Khufu shut down all the temples. He needed literally all the educated priests to engineer and build Giza. Every priest needed to be at Giza to build pyramids, to form committees, to put all the human knowledge into this structure. This shows me he was possibly an outsider from somewhere in Eurasia who renewed the pyramid religion in Egypt, which had been pre-existing and set up by previous dynasties. In representing the earth, you wanted to get it right. Hence again, the need for high technology, astronomy, libraries, committees of professors, committee after committee after committee. They built something at the center of their country to last for all time. This was their Hoover Dam. It, was, it is hard for their efforts to ever find their equal. And one must imagine they must have had in their possession an enormous library at Heliopolis, an absolutely phenomenal library which, which has not survived. So that is basically what makes a pyramid. Those are its criteria. In my opinion, there are other criteria such that it might merely look like a mountain. Um, but there are even flat representations. Philip Copens showed some, even fields of crops which look like pyramids. And 
I've noticed that uh, that famous well in Sardinia that I keep mentioning, uh, mentioning uh, it has a sphere, it has a triangle for a pyramid, it has a light show, it lets light into the pyramid. We'll see that later on why that's important. And it was also near, uh, and and it's associated with water. The pyramids are associated with water. And and I think I think I should mention that a pyramid should also be located near a river so that people can actually get to it. Most of the pyramids we know are, are near rivers. And you will also see pyramids where the landscape is dramatic and changing from one type to another, emphasizing the creative aspect of the world mountain, home of the triple goddess, possibly and many associated gods, because this world mountain is creating variety around it creating landscape in different directions. It's a miniature planet Earth seeding the actual planet Earth. That's possibly the Stone Age conception. Back to the hemisphere. The Earth representation explains why in Eurasia pyramids are literally hemispheres. Look all over Eurasia. You will see hemispherical pyramids, hemispherical mounds. You will see hemispherical stupas with a kind of world tree on top. Uh, with a, w the, the early stupas were literally a hemisphere with a stick on top representing world tree. And to my mind, they all meet the pyramid definition in terms of having a highest point. In Krakow, I got the shock of my life when we finally visited the prehistoric Krakos Mound. And Krakow, Krakos Mound, a King Krak, it's named after an ancient country in the region once called Croatia, but it was conquered by the Poles whose people, and the Croats, uh, it seems they migrated south, or, and, and the rest of them remained. So, when I got there, I noticed a plateau in front of me. Weird. And the highest, it was the highest point all around, just like Giza. And the plateau itself is also shaped like a large mound. So I thought, hmm, okay, where's the mound? I can't see the mound. And next to the plateau, I saw an ancient cemetery, and I thought, well, that's just like Giza, a cemetery next to it. So I thought, what other similarities would there be? So when we got to the top of the plateau, then I saw this perfect hemisphere uh, waiting to be climbed. It had a flat top, clearly a representation of the Earth or one hemisphere of it. As for its cardinal alignments, these can often be explained by the shape of the plateau, as well as lee line alignments in, in, uh, in other directions from horizon to horizon. Uh, this is just one of many, many identical example, uh, examples I encountered, and, and I detailed this in my Pyramids book. It was really an amazing experience. These are associated with spiritual energies. Uh, my mum, I was there with my mum. She became spiritual and started channeling the ancestors. It was amazing. Now, in light of the above and the discoveries, uh, my patron has approached me because he knows all this, and he's asked, okay, Charles, if these are Earth representation mounds, why build them so large? And with such accuracy, something as Chris Dunn so rightly points out, we could not do now. Okay, to answer this, I've discussed the why of the pyramids being so large. They were literally Earth. Notice they were also built from what we called Earth. They're built, they're, they're Earth built from Earth. Earth is the same word as heart, you will notice. Heart, the center of the body, pyramid the center of the land. A more accurate word is not pyramid, which is a mathematical way of describing a mound. What we want is what it is. And I think heart or earth is a very good word to describe what a pyramid is. We have also answered the reason for accuracy, to truly bless, to truly create the world around it. The pyramid needed to be to very accurately represent that world as close as possible. One can imagine, otherwise, another world would be blessed. Now, number two, my patron asks, the interior of the pyramid is clearly, and he writes this in capital letters, clearly technological. He says, although I have viewed your triple earth uh, interpretation, I think he means triple goddess interpretation, I feel there are a lot of inconsistencies which point to the pyramid as being technological and not representative. Although I acknowledge both representations may be true. So he thinks it's just pure technology. It's a machine. It's got a function. And here's what I say. I agree with my patron. And in the past, I've gone to such lengths as to even suggest that interferometry was being utilized, a 20th century science because I noted that the shafts in the pyramid seem to twin or double each other in length, 
shooting in different directions. The shafts are long and narrow like a telescope, perfect for directing light. Further confirmation is this, of this is that Newgrange, Ireland, an Irish pyramid also surrounded by white stones, is a literal internal light show. So I now think interferometry or checking the interference generated in a returning light ray is by its shifting position is probably a bridge too far, a little too advanced for the pyramid builders. But if they were at a 19th century level of advancement, they, then the, they might have approached this. So let's stick to Stone Age. We can speculate that something yet to be discovered, a kind of new Grange light show exists inside the Great Pyramid. It once happened at Giza. We just haven't realized how it works just yet. We haven't noticed it. I imagine the granite sarcophagus was probably illuminated on certain days using mirrors. Now, I don't think it's a sarcophagus. I think it's a representation, the earliest representation of the Ark of the Covenant. I, I really, I strongly suspect this. I'll tell you why in a second. I think it was illuminated to make the idea of ancient technology come alive. Because the idea of ancient technology is unbelievably ancient. And it is not just an idea. It is common knowledge in India and Sri Lanka because this is what their ancient traditions say. I think the Ark legend is far older than the Bible the Jews just picked up in Egypt. And it's, this is proven, I'm not just saying this, it's proven by the fact that the Egyptians, long before the Hebrews left Egypt, seem to have worshipped the very same box. I do not think the pyramid was a power plant, it simply has the wrong layout. But I'm not against saying that a mechanical or even steam-powered network was utilized in ancient times. The Greeks seem to have sourced their steam engine ideas from the Library of Alexandria, books stored from the beginning of time and collected from all, from all travelers and temples in Egypt. I think the microwave satellite idea of Christopher Dunn is pure speculation without some kind of solid evidence being provided or any kind of solid evidence being provided, unfortunately. The third question of my patron, number three. So he says, in my own research, I have found that the Egyptian hieroglyphs for pyramid are simply a triangle. The Greek word for pyramid, as I am sure you are well aware, means pyre, pyre far in the middle, mid. Obviously, this is meant to convey something energetic. Nuclear occurring within the structure. Otherwise, why didn't the Greeks simply name them triangulus or some such? To me, this is not a simple triple earth representation. I think he means triple mother goddess representation, because that's, that's the theory I put out in my pyramids book. Now, <clears throat> my response, I have accounted for this in my book on pyramids. You will note that the, the Britannica 1972 article from which I quoted actually doesn't mention the fire within etymology for the term pyramid, and in, but it does talk about spurious etymologies. But I think it could have credence. It could have merit. Why? Because Greek people on here have implored to me in comments that this is exactly what it means, fire within. And I'll tell you why I think the Greeks call the pyramid as such, but I don't think they were talking about the Egyptian pyramids initially, and here's why. Um, it sounds like the mathematical usage of the Egyptian word, firstly. So they decided to apply this to the Egyptian pyramids. And secondly, they were deriving mathematical ideas from old Egyptian texts. They were reading these texts. So the, the Greeks picked up a mathematical word, per emuus, and they probably associated with their own word, pyramid. And I'll tell you why. Because you see, the Greeks would literally holiday in Egypt. It's not that far. And now let's talk about fire. So let me tell you a story. Several years ago, while camping in Tasmania, we just couldn't get a fire started. It didn't help that it was winter and on a mountain, and we were in a tent with temperatures below freezing and it was wet. The previous night, the owner of the caravan park checked on us in the morning saying, I'm just checking to see if you're still alive. We realized we actually needed to get warm in order to go to sleep because it was just too cold to sleep. We tried everything. Even petrol didn't seem to work to start a fire, which those who camp and try and burn wet wood can understand. But assembling the sticks like a pyramid really helped. And finally, we had a really roaring fire, which was the envy of the camping ground. The following morning, it was too cold to start the car, but one of the campers said he saw how we had been showing off with our awesome fire. Fire within. That's where the fire is. I think that's why the Greeks called a pyramid that, based on the need to always be building fires to keep warm in winter. And when I was watching this fire in Tasmania, I had the revelation. This is what fire within means. This is where the Greek word comes from. 
This is the origin of the pyramid shape with an apex in my opinion. What else is shaped like a pyramid? Tell me, except maybe a hat or a cake or a pillar. A mountain, I guess. Fire within. It's also easy to account for mythologically. So here we go, mythologically. The fire god is the god of technology. And I think the pyramid is literally a mastaba or tomb for a god because gods live at World Mountain after all, near World Tree. Uh, the fire god, the technology god, was thrown out of heaven for being arrogant and hating the other gods. And he was buried underground, buried possibly in a kind of mountain or just underground. So this is where the technology god lives. It's where the trinity of Norns live. I've talked about the trinity seen at Giza. That can't be a coincidence. They worship the number three. Now look at Khufu's god. His name is Knum. In fact, the name of the pyramid is Horizon of Khufu, uh, which I've translated as a Sunrise of Khufu, which is uh, something that happens on the horizon. And Khufu is sometimes written as Knum Khufu. In other words, it's a compound word between a god and Khufu himself. Isn't that strange? So God in this case is the creator of man on the potter's wheel. That's Khufu, that's Knum. We are looking here at the God who made man from clay, at least the version in Egypt in 2400 BC. Sound familiar? It goes without saying that this is also the technology God because he's also, you know, he's the God of the Ark in the Bible. And this explains why something the size of the Ark of the Covenant or about that size, it doesn't have to be exact, is found in the king's chamber. I think it's an ark, not a sarcophagus. It's, to my mind, a little too small to contain the elaborate box within box within box, which later Egyptians used to dress up their kings within. On the contrary, the Temple of Solomon, the structure built by the Jews after they left Egypt, where they lived, possibly among the Giza pyramids, kept their ark alone in, his whole, in their holy of holies. They did not keep a dead king in a sarcophagus in their Temple of Solomon. And to my mind, the Temple of Solomon is very pyramid like. Now I've proven that the pyramid was more a temple complex than a tomb because of the festival dates found there, found there which needed a year-round priesthood to officiate. And what came out of the ark? Strange fire. This is possibly the fire within, an artifact, a relic of the primordial fallen technological god which was said to have created man, helping man with fire. It is he who gave fire to man against the wishes of all the other gods. It is he the pyramid builders worshipped. When we search for something which generated monotheism, we have some options. We can look to the sun, we can look to the moon, we can look to the earth, or we, that's a, 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 those three are a kind of trinity. Or we can look to the God of technology who benefacted mankind, tried to elevate him to a civilization in a forgotten time. And we are starting to talk about the God of the Old Testament. And when was that time? Who can say? There have been catastrophe after catastrophe. And I've noticed there are even many, many catastrophes mentioned in Chronicles which you look it up, there is no known catastrophe. So these are waiting to be discovered. Now, two years ago, we could travel internationally. That travel is, is now forbidden in many countries. So you see how quickly and unexpectedly a powerful civilization is destroyed. Thank you.